The Heritage Foundation looked at some government data. It shows the average, typical American uh, poor person, according to the traditional pre-Obama poverty measure, has two, two color televisions, poor. They have cattle, a, sa a satellite or a cable TV service. They have a VCR or DVD player. They have a stereo. Uh, now, I don't know if I, this could be an old boxy 1990s, not a flat screen. I'm not sure. And I didn't mention about, you know, anything, anything at all about broadband, you know, high-speed Internet. How many people living in cardboard huts in southern Ethiopia can microwave a bowl of popcorn while watching HBO? Not too many, I'm guessing. Now, I want you to know, I'm not saying that being poor in America is sweet. It's not. It's never fun being poor. It's not opulent or overly ostentatious to be poor in America. But this isn't Zimbabwe. Have you ever seen what life is like for those people living on the outskirts of Mexico City? They live in boxes. When everybody gets a participation trophy at the end of the season, it doesn't mean anything. Americans aren't about participation trophies, or we better damn stop it. We're, we're about telling the coach, take the trophy back. That's where you need to stand. Teach your children now. My son, my daughter didn't own, earn the trophy. They played hard, they played well, but they didn't win. We maybe will get the real trophy next year. Don't give me this bogus trophy. Life isn't about the trophies. It's about improving yourself. It's about accomplishment. There are two sports that are very, very similar in many ways, but they have key differences. Track and cross country. Both involve a lot of running, require endurance, and in some cases running long distances. But track, the focus of the competition is to beat everybody else on the track with you. And everybody else is a pack of losers. Well, that's not the capitalist system. They're trying to convince you that it is. There's only a few winners and everybody else is a loser. No, no, no. No. Everybody has the opportunity to run. Some grab the medal, some don't. Then there's cross country. This is the idea that you're competing against yourself. In cross country, you want to beat your personal best. You help the team win. You may not be the first person, you may be the last person, but you help the team. My daughter has cerebral palsy. When she first went out for cross country, her coach said, look, you can just sit down in the middle of the race. You, know, you don't expect to finish it. That offended her. When she graduated from high school, she was the captain of her cross-country team. She completed every race she ran in. She finished last. In last place, every single race she ran. Every race. We had to watch the time ourselves because they took down that big official clock. By the time she finished, the cross, crossed the finish line, they were all gone. I guess some people could say, well, she failed, and try to compensate her for her perceived failure, forcing those around or all around her to start later, maybe dishing out time penalties to others because that would give her a better chance. That wouldn't help her. That would cripple her. She beat her personal time, her personal best time every single race because of her hard work. She was competing against herself. She earned better times as she ran. She was a winner because she continued to make herself the best she could be. She overcame her own personal obstacles. She didn't worry about anybody else being handicapped, you know, so she could compete. She competed. She finished every race. She did so with honor and integrity. When she graduated, they asked her to give the speech at the end of the banquet. She was the team captain in her senior year. She said, I was told I couldn't compete. I was told that I wouldn't finish the race. It has been my goal to finish every race, and I did. America, we need to overcome our obstacles. 
We need to finish the race. Forget about the trophy. Others are going to have it better than us. Others will run faster. That's okay. We just need to become the best we can be. Carl Rove, he's got a new book out, Courage and Consequence, My Life as a Conservative in the Fight. He has been there um, for a very long time fighting the good battle. Carl, how are you? Fabulous. I'm, I'm even better now that I got the, oh, yeah, the double fried serious, cherry thing. I'm yes. going, I'm, you can have the Twinkie or whatever. That I is, did. But I had I'm, the but I'm having, I'm having the... I've had one of each. They're both <laughs> great. Um, I want to talk to you about, and I know I, I make everybody angry about this. I believe there are good Republicans. I also believe there are good Democrats. Mm -hmm. They're good, decent people in both parties. There's a lot of scumbags in both parties. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I mean, we have Lindsey Graham, who is fighting for cap and trade. Right. Uh, he's fighting for uh, identification cards. He's fighting, uh, he's, he's fighting for immigration reform, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, you read his stuff, it's like mm -hmm. reading Obama's campaign speech. Mm -hmm. When do you see the Republicans finding a leader that can sell it, make a, I mean, people don't care about party anymore. Mm -hmm. I really don't think. They yeah. just want somebody who says, these are the values and this is what we're standing up yeah. for. Uh, look, the, the Republican Party, like any party that doesn't control the White House, will not get a single voice or a single leader until the 2012 presidential election. And frankly, I don't want one person now. You know, but, right, right now, if we're going to be in the minority, and we are in the minority because we don't control the White House, the House, or the, or the Senate, I want, I, you know, I want Paul Ryan to become a leader. I want, you know, John Boehner to step out. I want, like they had in the debate, I wanted Barrasso and Coburn. I thought that was fantastic that on the, in the Kabuki Theater at the Blair House I'm that they saying, step uh, forward. No, I'm not saying that. I mean, it seems to me that America is coalescing. You see it by the drop in both parties' numbers. They're both going down. The independents now outnumber both parties. And so there's, yeah. there's this idea, and I think having a third party, it could be a nightmare. Yeah, sure. I don't, the, America, sure. there's so many conservatives that are saying, please, Republicans, get your yeah. stuff together. Well, and, and look, I think that will happen as the year goes on and as we go through these primaries and nominate candidates and we find inspirational voices that say, here's what I believe, and people say, you know what, I agree with that. And that's just a natural process of things. I, I, I have great optimism. I'm looking at these candidates, uh -huh. and I'm seeing what's happening out there. And we're going to have we're going to have. Who's a, the most inspiring person that you have seen out there? Well, this, this this year, I mean, I, I got to tell you, I think Paul Ryan, the way he stepped up in that in, in, in that debate, Jeb Hanserly, when he stepped up to the president in Baltimore, I thought was terrific. I thought Tom Price did a great job. Lamar Alexander was the absolute best voice to begin the Republican, the Republican dialogue at that Blair House meeting. There are lots of these people out there. When I thought about, you know, got up this morning, I thought Carl was going to be on the program and stuff, and I thought about all the things that you have seen and, uh, through 9-11 and the bullhorn moment and everything else. Right. It's been eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. If I would have told you when he got back from the fire, you know, the fire truck, and I said, Carl, in eight to nine years, we're going to have a Congress that is hostile to almost every principle of our founding. We're going to have a president who surrounded himself with Mao supporters. Would you believe me? No, but, uh, you know, 2006 for me was an epiphany, and I write about it in there. You know, we didn't lose it because of Iraq. If we lost 2006 because of Iraq, then you've got to explain why people like Chris Shays out here in the suburban district out in mm -hmm. southeastern, or excuse me, southwestern Connecticut, who makes the entire issue Iraq wins. How, how, does, how does our candidate in, in uh, Heather Wilson in, in New Mexico win? Name, name of the book, read about it. The name of the book is Consequence and, uh, Courage and Consequence by Carl Rove. Sir, as always. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. You know, yesterday I had uh, Congressman Massa on, and I had no idea what I was going to say, what questions, what to prepare for, really, because I hadn't talked to him in advance and didn't want to. 
Um, we were sitting in my office yesterday, and we had the conversation with my staff, and I wrote the monologue and, and also discussed with my staff what are the questions I'm going to ask. A lot of people would like to see how this show's put together. We now have up on my website at glenbeck.com called the Insider Extreme. It, it features the radio program and all kinds of things. But up there today is uh, because the cameras were rolling in my office. We now have cameras everywhere. You can see exactly how we made the decisions we made yesterday. Join up now, Insider Extreme at glenbeck.com. Right back. America. You are going to be the key. You are the answer. But we have to remember who we are. And that, re that means that we have to sometimes remember things we don't want to. Tomorrow is a very special broadcast on extremists in America. Not the skinheads, not the things that you're seeing today, but from the past. Don't miss it. It's a don't miss show. Definitely tomorrow night. From New York, good night.